Hey everybody and welcome back. Today we are actually going to be applying some machine learning work, um, the k-means clustering algorithms that we introduced a week ago. We're actually going to apply that to some advanced NBA stats today and we're going to start grouping our players into player archetypes based on play style. One reason I find this helpful <clears throat> is not every player's position is indicative of how they play the game, right? Like you can have a player be a shooting guard, but they might be your primary ball handler, so they function more as a point guard, or in reality, they function more as a ball handler, or an off-the-ball guard, or a wing, a ball-dominant wing. A big man, but some big men, you know, are really good at backing people down to the basket. Some big men are good facilitators. Some big men can stretch the floor and hit the three and all of them just get wrapped up under center or power forward right so we don't just want to look at a player's position and think about how they'll play because there's going to be a lot of variance between how point guards historically score against I don't know the Milwaukee Bucks okay but if we look specifically as a ball dominant facilitator against the Milwaukee Bucks there's probably going to be a little less variance there because all those players have the same play style. So while there's going to be some other things that come into that equation, like their teammates, so for instance, it doesn't, it might not matter that you're a ball dominant facilitator if no one on your team can make a shot or no one on your team can get open for you to facilitate them taking a shot, right? So there's more to it than that, but this gives us a little bit better idea and something a little more directed to work with than just general position. So, this is a very big topic. We're gonna to be breaking it into two parts. Um, there will be a written tutorial online on my blog as usual. The example data set for the advanced statistics will be there to download so you can follow along exactly what I'm doing with the same data and the Jupyter Notebook file as well so you can follow along line by line with the code and kind of help mitigate general just uh, mistype as you're following along. Without further ado, let's hop into the code and get going. As always, we have our import statements here. I'm not going to go through them one by one. Um, not all of them will be used in this video because this is broken out into two parts, but this import set is the overall import set of what we're going to be using for the entire clustering process. So go ahead and plug those in. If you don't have any of them, pip install. If you don't know how to do that, you're getting a little ahead of yourself, head back to my Welcome to Python video, and I'll go over some of the basics like that. Whoa. So, first things first, we need to bring our data in. You can see pd.readexcel, it's an Excel file, not a CSV. I'm going ahead and setting the index as player, because that's the, the column name for what my player data is, um, mainly so I can enforce everything else as type numpy float. So what numpy is going to do is put everything in an array form, a numpy array, and it's going to enforce all of them as float values if it looks like a number. If player was kept in this data set without being the index, I'd be getting errors probably because it can't turn a name into a float, and I don't want any of these to be reading as strings or integers or anything like that. So that's just a quick data check to go at the very beginning. Um, there is a lot there, was, as you can see in the file name here, 2019-20 all stats clean. There's a little bit of cleanup that needed to take place with the data um, coming raw out of the NBA website. Um, and let's go ahead and take a look at that data real quick. Just to kind of get a little familiarity with this if you haven't downloaded it yet. Um, we have 30 advanced stats here and if you've never played around with the NBA stats website I strongly recommend just kind of playing around with it and seeing what all is there um, the way that these are named just so I would know where they came from and what they were is kind of the name of the general stat table it's in is first and then the stat itself second so this is from advanced stats assist percent offensive rebound percent defensive rebound percent overall rebound percent now, as we discussed earlier, there's going to be quite a bit of correlation between these guys here. True shooting percent, usage percent, pace. Uh, I can never remember what pi stands for, but pi 
and then we go on to a different data set post up defense possessions points per possessions so on and so forth down to transition offensive possessions transition offensive points per possession so these are going to be more of kind of how a player plays what they're doing while they're in the game more than just you know their their box score because if we just looked at every player that averages 30 fantasy points a night and over and maybe that's something you want to do and that's perfectly fine but that's not what we're doing for this um, and it, it may pay great dividends to focus on you know the 40 plus average points a night player and get a good model that just looks at them to see what they're doing good and doing bad more power to you i think you'll find most of those types of players are probably going to be in the same cluster anyways just because their numbers are going to be so much higher and more efficient than some of the others. But anyways, that's what this data set is. Um, go ahead and download it from my blog so you can follow along and have the exact same numbers. Heading back to the code. So we established our data frame here. Next thing I'm going to do is establish a new data frame that moves the player name back in here as a normal column by resetting the index um, and then I just double check my initial data frame here to make sure that I didn't mess this one up okay and that's going to be important that we've done this um, so we have it to use a little bit later so this is my data here that I have I mean we just looked at it in Excel so nothing nothing out of the ordinary here We've got 30 columns, not counting the players, the index, and then we're showing the first five rows as the head. So, next up, we're creating a list called features. So, one thing you'll need to get a little used to if you want to get a little more into machine learning. The data that you're using um, is referred to as a feature. So one kind of hot topic word you'll probably see a lot if you look into researching this any of yourself is going to be feature engineering. And that's basically the process of finding the ideal features to be utilized in different algorithms. Okay. So you going through and picking out your advanced stats, that would be like feature engineering for your algorithm. So <clears throat> what we're going to be doing here is creating a list of features, just calling it features. That's what you typically call the the stats or the data that you're using for machine learning are going to be your features. And then if you have what you're trying to predict or something, those are typically going to be referred to as labels. Um, but first, just so you can see here, we have all of our column names. These are the stats that we are using. And then we're creating an x equals df dot location. Um, features.values. So let me real quick comment that out and rerun that before we scale it so you can see what this is. So what I've done here is created the numpy array that's going to just be the data. <clears throat> okay, because the, the machine learning algorithms they factor in the data itself. It doesn't care about what the name of each stat is, they just need the stats in the same order and the same columns for every player. So all I've done here is create a new data frame using the features list is the columns that I'm interested in and saying that I just want the values. Don't care about the columns, don't care about the index, I just want the values. And then what we're going to do next is we're going to scale that data because there's a pretty, pretty high variance in here from player to player among each data point for, for each column, each feature. And that's going to make it difficult to identify the trends for machine learning algorithms. So what is typically viewed as good practice is going to be to scale your data using a, a just a normal, we're using sklearn standard scaler. And if we run x again, we can now see that it's been scaled down. So you take the variance here and like a min and a max and it gets applied I believe this is between negative one and one it looks like yeah so then it, it puts like the minimum value is now negative one the maximum value for that column is now one and everything else is scaled in between that so it maintains the same performance relationships it just cranks it down within that smaller range 
okay? And that's going to make it much more efficient to run over and get more accurate results for the most part. Where you can get a little bit off here, which you're going to find is going to give you issues in pretty much every single data analysis you do are massive outliers, okay? Which for the advanced stats, why I wouldn't recommend doing it on this season yet because it's such a small sample size or there are going to be some massive outliers here. Um, and we just, we don't want to deal with that. So give it, I'd say wait until you're about 20 games into the season, you have a decent sample size and you can filter the players you're using where they only want players that have played more than X number of games and average more than Y minutes per game. So we have players with a good sample size. Because you have somebody that's been injured, they come back for one game, they play phenomenal. Their numbers are going to be off the charts for efficiency because they don't have the bad games to average them out. So those are all things you take into consideration when you're actually acquiring your data. And we'll go over that at a later point. I just want to kind of go over how this works now. And then we can go in and spend some more time on how to gather the data, how to clean the data up for it and so on and so forth because there's quite a bit of customization you can do in the process that we're going over now on one data set to really to play around and learn it a little bit better so now that we have scaled our data we're ready to start figuring out how many components we want okay and remember the components for principal component analysis is what we're reducing down the number of columns for essentially if we come back up to our tabular data we're reducing the total number of columns or the total numbers per player that we're feeding into our algorithm. So first up, we need to just define an empty list of variants. And then we're going to loop through because we obviously want at least two components. We don't want to condense all of these numbers down into one. We know that's very bad. And we also know that we don't want to use all of them. And the reason why, which we'll see in a minute, is we're going to get diminishing returns after a certain point. Well, yes, technically it's getting more accurate the more you bring in, but you're gaining so little and you're adding in that much more opportunity for a mistake to be made by bringing in more and more that in this instance it doesn't end up tailing off and getting less accurate, but when we get into regression analysis and actually predicting um, like fantasy points, you, you will notice there's going to be a point where if we start bringing in too much, it adds too much variance, and it actually starts to get less accurate. But for now, we're just looking at four, however many components we have, from components two up to using every single status 30. We're looking at the explained variance ratio. And what the explained variance ratio is going to be, basically, we're trying to bring through as much of the initial variance as we can while still being efficient. So the explained variance ratio is going to be the variance of this new data set condensed down to two components. And we're looking at how much information we're retaining basically compared to our full data set. And those diminishing returns there is essentially going to be highly correlated data where you're, you're really not learning that much more about the player by bringing in multiple data sets that are highly correlated because they all kind of tell you the same thing. So running through the code here, we have four end components in range 2 to 31. Remember, for Python, you'll stop one number before the end of your range, so really that's two components to 30 components. PCA, we're going to run the principal component analysis function from the sklearn that we imported and the number of components is n components because we don't know how many components we want yet. So we're iterating and we're running that function every time. And then we are fitting our x data to our components. And we're going to get the variance, which is the sum. And just the explained variance ratio is just something we call from our PCA function. And then we are going to append that value up here in our variance list. Okay. And then we're just going to print it out here so we can see it. So we're going to run through and run a PCA analysis for every single instance, every single different number of components. And we're going to review that explained variance ratio. So we have that here. 
And as we can see, components equal two, we're retaining less than half the information. Three, we jump up to about 57%, 63, 68, 72. So we can see every time we bump up another component, we're increasing, but we increase by a little less and a little less and a little less every time because there's only so much more to bring in. We got up here to 30. You can see we're at, that's obviously just a rounding thing here. So we're at 100%, we have all the data. 29, we have 0 0.999, 0 0.997, 9997, sorry, 999, 997, 995, 992, 988. So if we're rounding to two figures there, we can drop all the way down to only 23 components and still have 99% of the total information available, right? So that makes it pretty clear the, the diminishing returns there. Is it how much, how valuable is it really to have all of that data? It doesn't make that big of a difference. So you might be wondering, how do we know exactly how many components to use? Well, if we remember what we did before in our last video with the elbow method, it's going to be something kind of similar to that, but not exactly. So what we're doing here is we're just going to plot these values against the components, okay? So nothing crazy. I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time going over how to create figures in Python. Just know that that is our matplotlib.pyplot, matplotlib.pyplot as PLT um, is what we're going to be using. Um, and you, it's pretty self-explanatory. Um, we're defining a style for the graph to look like. If you go to matplotlib.pyplotstyles, there's a whole list of them. They'll tell you what they are. You pick one you like, and you can use that. Not a problem. And we'll just do, you know, our plot range, variance list, set our labels, set our tick marks, figure title. And then this here, I'm just saving this locally so I can upload it onto the blog. Um, so it's there as well. You don't have to save it. That's just if you want to save it to look at later. So we run that. And looking at the graph, we can kind of tell the same thing, like 23, 24%. We're basically at 100. And you can see that that's a fairly, you know, it's not a straight line. There's definitely the higher up you get, it tapers off. We got a, a nice curve there. But still, that doesn't really help us figure out which component is the most ideal. Because for the most ideal, we want to be gaining the most information relative to what we had before, while having enough information still to make it worthwhile. So what we're going to do is we're going to calculate the slope for each of these points and compare it to the slope at the point before it. So we're just going to import this function here from NumPy. Um, if you haven't done any calculus in a long time, the slope is the rise over run. So we have the change in the y value over the change in the x value. So dx equals 1 because we know we're increasing the x by 1 every time. We don't need to calculate anything for that. y equals variance list. That's going to be this here where we plugged in the variance, so how much that changes. Um, and then the, the diff function is going to calculate how much that changes from y to y dy is going to be how much it changes here because we're doing the, the difference in y over the difference in x which we already know is only one so same deal we're just going to plot that again dy is not defined did i not run that one nope okay so now we have the rate of change for our components and this is where we're getting back to where we were in our last video going over the actual change going component to component where we're kind of looking for an elbow where that slope kind of tapers off because if we look at this our the change in y over the change in x starts off very intense and this farther we go the more it kind of levels out to where here the change in y is virtually zero per the change in x so we're looking for kind of that elbow point where it's going to really start tapering off and to me, it looks like at about 13, right? 13, we have that noticeable kind of hitch there. And then that is going to be a fairly straight line from 13 to at least 19. And it's going to kick again a little. So we have 13, 
we have 19 you could use it there 25 same deal but again this is such a small difference that we're really looking down here at 13 is where I think we're gonna go with I'm gonna go with 13 going forward it's my lucky number it seems like the best elbow to use where we're still gaining information if we come up and look at the total for 13 that gives us 89% of the total information which is quite a bit I mean we would have to jump from 13 all the way up to 18 to be getting about 95% and that still falls kind of here within the straight line where that's kind of a, a stagnant rate of change it's not really changing much it's going to be pretty similar from component to component so we're going to stick with 13 components in this example going forward you're more than welcome to choose something different if you like but your results going forward are going to be a little bit different than mine probably so if you want to run through it once with me let's stick with 13. Um, that's going to be all that we go through for part one